love to introduce Dawn Whitestone, who is founding partner of Whitestone Professionals. She is the executive coach and author of Strategic Business Prayers with the Strategic Business Prayer Workbook. Thank you so much for joining us, Dawn. Thanks for having me, Christine. I'm excited about being here today. Thank you. Thank you. You and I were having a conversation last week about the different components of our health. And I, I was mentioning to you how I interviewed Karen Kelly, who is a, a, um, a nurse, and she was talking about the, the physical components of our health. And so you and I started talking about how there's a whole, there's a whole, um, uh, multiple parts to it, rather, to mm -hmm. the whole. So can you go into it a little bit more with us? Absolutely. And I know a lot of people are visual and as am I. So let me share with you a screen uh, that talks a little bit about how we look at the components of health. So Christine, as you know, my background is in counseling. I am a licensed mental health counselor, but I work primarily as a business coach. And so it's like, whoa, those are two very different things. But, you know, business people are still people. And as individuals, a lot of times what holds people back in business is what's going on between their two ears. And so we can be our own worst enemy. We can, we can sabotage ourselves, whether it's in business or in life. And so when people come to me, um, whether it was when I was working primarily as a counselor or now when I'm working as a coach, I help them look at three areas of their life, and that's the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual areas of life. Now, um, most counselors or coaches would look at the emotional and the physical areas, but the spiritual is a little unusual. So let's unpack the three of these things yeah. right now and, and talk a little bit about how we can look at those. So the first area is the physical. And that's the easiest one to see and to fix. And so if somebody comes into me and let's say they're, they're anxious or they're depressed and um, they recognize that they're, let's say they're a business person, but they recognize that they're sabotaging sales because they get angry at their customers or, you know, they know something's going on that they need to work on. Well, the first thing that we're going to look at is the easiest thing, mm -hmm. which is the physical. So how are you eating? How are you sleeping? Are you getting enough exercise? Is there any physical dysregulation that may be causing these emotional outbursts or um, the thought processes that are going on. And I've actually had clients that is, as we've had our first appointment, I've said to them, I don't want to see you again in my office until you go get a physical with your doctor. Because I think there may be some physical things going on here that could be corrected um, with a, a difference in medication. You know, you, you may need medication management more than you need anything else. Mm -hmm. So um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I see people all the time where exercise is, is not on their agenda at all, but they just don't know the benefits to exercise. Mm -hmm. Or drinking enough water. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and so, so sometimes as part of a coaching program, we may implement some of these things. I mean, people may come in and we recognize, you know, you, it would help your anxiety level if you would get out and take a walk once an evening. And so that may go into the goals and objectives that we have for them. Absolutely. Um, so the physical is often, um, it's definitely the easiest to take a look at. It's the easiest to see. And sometimes it's the easiest to make adjustments to and fix. Mm. The, um, the second area is the mental emotional area. So this is what people normally think of when they think of mental health. Um, that has to do with your thought patterns and your emotional habits. Now, Christine, I know you know this. But um, did you know that we have emotional habits? Hmm. And we can get into habits. Um, anxiety can become a habit. When, when, if you practice a thought pattern often enough, what happens in the brain is it, is it goes from being gray matter, which, is, which operates at about either five or six cycles per second. Mm -hmm. um, if you do something often enough, 
it will myelinate in the brain. And, and when it myelinates, it goes, it becomes 200 times faster. So if you do something often enough, that's how we form habits and how things become automatic. Yeah. And, and so sometimes we, if, if we've been in under a great deal of stress for a long period of time, so let's say we have a loved one who is chronically ill and very sick, and, and over the course of six months to a year, we're taking care of them, mm. uh, and, and we just get into this habit of worrying about them all the time. Well, even if they get better, um, or for some reason we no longer have to take care of them, we may find that we're still worried about them, and we're like, everything's better now why am i still having these issues mm. well it it was it happened oh the, the stressor was there for such a long period of time that it it became a a an emotional habit and that habit has to be undone and so that takes a process as well and so um so we need to look at thought patterns um we I hear that dynamic a lot with when children are sick and the parents they're perpetually worrying about them and they grow out of whatever it is that they were sick with but their parents don't actually allow them to heal because they're constantly it's their pattern yes and and so it is one of the things that we do as coaches or that counselors can do is to help people discover identify what those thought patterns are and and their thought patterns their emotional habits that are not serving them well and help them correct those and in some ways um, those are it's actually a physical issue because you've created neuron neuronal pathways in the brain mm -hmm. um, but the way that you undo them is is by practicing different thought patterns and so, um, Christine, you know, like we have an entire, we have a 30 day program that people can walk through on their own called the joy reset project that will, that helps people to go from a, a normal mood state of anxiety or depression or, or just a low mood where they're, they're operating from the back of their brain in fight or flight mode to walk through a process of, of making it a habit to practice appreciation and joy. So you can actually retrain your brain from operating back here where you don't feel well to up here where you have better thought patterns and you're able to think more clearly, make better decisions. You're operating from joy rather than operating from depression or irritability or um, being stressed out all the time. And the practice, it's so funny because it's just the same way as if you were doing push-ups. The more push-ups that you do, the more muscle that you build. So it's just a physical representation of what's going on in our brain. You will see the effects. It's amazing. Yes, yes. And, and so um, people, I, I find it very helpful to help people understand what's actually going on inside of their brain so they understand why we're asking them to do certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and I this when I was doing a lot more counseling uh, and less coaching and I did a lot of work with children and what invariably happened was mom was bringing the child in for counseling and very often dad wasn't in agreement and I would send them home with homework that dad didn't understand you know it's like you want me to sing <laughs> you want you know and, and this is all fluff you know people people think it's fluff work right well when I when so I would always ask that that dad would come in for at least two sessions and I would sit down and I would explain the brain science so that he could understand that the things that we're asking you to do for homework are actually rewiring the brain and they're going to help and here's how they're going to help so mm -hmm. it's very it's a really good thing to understand that but that's that's that em emotional mental circle and we could talk about that for a really long time but that's not what you wanted me to talk about no <laughs> so, so let's look also at the third area which which is the spiritual area um, and spirituality is a lot about relationships and, and it's about our relationships with each other and our relationship with God and our relationship with the spiritual world. Now, whether someone um, believes in, in spirits or not, um, you can look at psychology and see how spiritual practices are incredibly helpful to people. So now, 
personally, I very much believe in God. I have a relationship with God, and, and it makes a big difference in how I view the world and my ability to, to have peace and calm and to live from a place that's very centered and grounded, as opposed to being anxious and feeling like, well, there's no meaning in the world anyway. So the spiritual aspect is, is, is all about meaning and how we understand how the world works. Um, neuroscience and psychology will tell us that trauma is not about what happens to you. It's about the meaning that you make of it. And so having a spiritual basis and a spiritual foundation, a spiritual understanding of the world can really make a difference in how well people handle how life comes at them. Mm. And that has to do with, um, we have down here, spiritual hygiene and spiritual habits. Sometimes we need to clean out our thoughts. You know, we may have gotten into some negative thought patterns, what uh, Dr. Daniel Amen calls ants, automatic negative thinking. Um, and spirituality is one of the ways that people can retrain their, their thoughts and get rid of those ants and have some automatic positive thinking, which is very interesting. It makes you act, <laughs> um, which is the ability to do something. So, so looking at spiritual hygiene, spiritual habits, prayer, and then, um, and then in what ways are we connecting? Are we connecting with a Holy Spirit? Or are we connecting with unholy spirits? Mm. And um, for those of us who come from a Christian background, we understand that there is a war going on um, for our very souls, that, that there is a good God and that there are good angels and bad angels, and they're fighting over us. And so that understanding of, of the war in heaven that is all about us can be very helpful as we look at our lives. You know, if, mm -hmm. if bad things keep happening to us, why do these bad things keep happening? And I've seen, even, even generationally, it's very interesting sometimes the things that happen to the people that, that you look at them and go, they had no control over what just happened to them. Mm -hmm. And yet, there is a pattern. This happened to their grandparents and to them, and now it's happening to them, and they've done everything in their power. There must be something bigger than us going on. Mm. There's also, um, Christine, have you ever read the book The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? I actually have it on my articles right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's on your, in your pile. I love that book because it is not a Christian book by any stretch of the imagination, but Pressfield talks about resistance and the fact that if it, it, the whole book is, is encouraging artists to get out there and give the world their talent and, and to, to dare to be the artist that, that you feel like you're called to be. Mm. But he's, he doesn't, you know, he's talking about resistance, and every time I read resistance, I thought, well, this sounds just like what the Bible says mm -hmm. about um, the devil or demons. So whether you think there is a real devil or whether it is a concept that is helpful to, um, to be able to fight that resistance, to get out there, and as Pressfield talks about, you need to, to leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home so that your family can eat. And, um, and that's especially helpful in business because we all, we do sometimes feel like we're in a war zone. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you come to work and you have your day mapped out for you and suddenly the internet is down and, um, you know, your computers aren't working and your person you needed in, in the office today calls in sick and suddenly everything's in, a, in an uproar and you feel like the whole world is against you. And so that spiritual aspect is very, very important mm. for helping people deal with life. So, um, well, let me ask you a question because I'm looking between the spiritual and the mental, and I'm thinking, well, where does it, where does identity come into play? Well, identity would be in the middle of all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, if, if you look at, I don't, can you see my arrow here on my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this area, really all of these things sit on top of each other. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, if, if we separate them out in order to have a, a paradigm, a way of thinking about things and of, of categorizing. But all of these are all about us. And, and so we are physical beings, we are emotional beings, and we are spiritual beings. And, and who we are really from a neuroscience tells us that, that I cannot know who I am as an individual without knowing who I'm a part of. Mm -hmm. So relationships are incredibly important to identity. And that is, that includes our relationships with other people and our relationship with God. And so understanding who I am as a person, um, involves all of these things as well as relationships. And, and if, if I were going to put it someplace, I would put relationships in the spiritual aspect, but obviously they affect us emotionally and physically as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that answer your question? It or? does. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Cause I know a lot of people, uh, when I first start working with them and they have trauma, I usually start at the fact that my trauma, when I tell my own story is that I didn't know who I was. I didn't really know who I was because I fixed my identity on things that were there. They weren't anchors. They were things that could change. My title could change. My position in life could change. And they did change. They did change. Um, so all those things were, were movable, but our identity really isn't something that's fixed on, on uh, an movable object, but an immovable uh, char list of characteristics. So that's really where I come into it. And I was looking at the list saying, I know it's mental and emotional and I know it's spiritual, but I didn't see how the physical would, would pull into it. But I have more to learn. <laughs> well, I think from an identity standpoint, mm -hmm. physically it would, it would have to do with genetics. Oh, so okay. yes. we have, we have a DNA. We, we have certain genes that are part of determining who we are and, and how we see ourselves. So, so there is a physical component to our identity. Mm -hmm. um, part of what we need from in our relationships, the reason that relationships are so important to our identity is we need people to recognize who we are. Mm -hmm. We need people who will say, Christine, when you walk into a room, you light the room up. You know, you are the kind of person who sees other people. And, and, and when we have good relationships with others who love us and, and who, will, who will give us an accurate picture mm -hmm. of what they see in us, they're, ref they're acting as mirrors and they're reflecting back to us who we are. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's important to know when it comes to identity is our, is our identity center in, in our brains, our identity center is actually right behind your right eyeball. It's in the right orbital prefrontal cortex. And it's the same place where you experience joy. So your identity is who you are when you are most joyful. Wow. You know, so when you're, when, when you're watching a sunset and you just, feel like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, this is so amazing. And, and you're having that sense of appreciation and transcendence, you know, for some people, they find a lot of it in nature. For other people, it may be when they are sweating it out, um, creating a, a landscape, um, for others, it may be creating, it may be teaching when they're in front of a classroom. They just feel like that, oh, this is when I feel most alive. And, and so that sense of joy, of feeling the most alive, of being in that flow, that's, a lot of that is, is about who we are. It's where we find a lot of satisfaction. And, and when we want to share an experience with others, um, that that is an experience of joy because joy is relational as well. So, um, yeah, that was really helpful beyond. <laughs> helpful. Thank you. Good. I hope so. So, so, uh, the way that we work with people at Whitestone professionals is we do look at all of these areas and often, often we specialize. So Christine, you specialize in, PTSD and P PNES and and you are such a nurturer and I enjoy that. 
and I specialize with business people and then and we have other coaches as well so it's it's fun to watch the different ways that people take this and then pour into the lives of the people that they're working with mm. it's such a pleasure to be able to come alongside people and I love the dynamics of, of our of what we do at, mm -hmm. at Whitestone Pros Mm -hmm. so. I love this next slide, so I'm very eager to see it. <laughs> oh, okay. I actually had not intended to share this, but there you go. I, so what action will you take? I, I am all about, you know, Christine, sometimes I like to call myself a growth catalyst. Yeah. Um, part of the reason I do coaching uh, now rather than counseling is I like to challenge people, and, mm -hmm. and I want them to take action. So when you understand your purpose, it helps you to create plans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's vertical alignment. When we're shooting at a target, we want to line up, line up the arrow with the target. And then um, understanding our relationships with people and how they can help us to be more productive is the horizontal alignment. So when you, when you have purpose and plans and you have that vertically aligned and then when you're working well with people to accomplish tasks mm -hmm. you can hit the bullseye mm -hmm. and hit your target so okay. what action are you going to take today to understand yourself better physically emotionally spiritually so that you can implement um, plans that help you to accomplish your purpose i love that you started into that because that leads me to probably my final question is so being a licensed mental health counselor how does that differ from what you're doing as a coach what how are the models different excellent question so counseling is a medical model and it is about it, you have a diagnosis and a treatment plan and it's focused on taking people from being unhealthy from disease to healthy all right so it's a it's a disease model mm -hmm. coaching is more of a sports model and it's it's all about goals and objectives so if you think in terms of let's say basketball uh, if you have a basketball player and they have a lousy lousy um, free throw shooting well, well we're gonna coach a, a coach will look at the, at you and help you improve your free throw and help you improve your game so that you can win more often. And so coaching takes you from where you are now to where you want to be. Mm. And, and they're, they're different models. There's, it's not that one is better than the other. It's what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. So if somebody needs a diagnosis, so for example, let's say, let's say you have a child and they're not functioning well in school and the school psychologist comes in and says, oh, well, this, this child has a learning disorder and they need um, treatment in order to correct this learning disorder. You need that. You need that diagnosis and you need a treatment plan to help them correct something that's not working right. But if you don't need a diagnosis and yet you've got some, some things that are holding you back from reaching your goals, mm -hmm. that's when you want to coach. Now the techniques can be very, very similar. I use a lot of the same things that I did as a counselor. I may use the same techniques for coaching. It's just that the, um, the way of looking at it, the grid that you're using to work with people is a little bit different. So does that make sense? It does, thank you. Because I have people asking me that all the time. Can I get what I need in, without having a therapist? You know, they'll say, well, I, I need a therapist. Or some people might say, I don't want to have this on my record. And right. so that's why they'll come to coaching. They don't want it part of their medical record. They don't want a diagnosis, yes. Right. And it, it can, there have, been, there have been times in the past when having a, a it's a pre-existing condition. If you have a mental health diagnosis, it can be a pre-existing condition. And so if you don't want a diagnosis, coaching can be a good option. Um, we're simply going to look at it as, all right, you have these obstacles, these, these barriers that are holding you back from reaching your goals. Now, a good coach will also, if they recognize that someone really needs to be diagnosed, a good coach will, will recommend counseling. Yeah. Because there are times when maybe you really do need a diagnosis. If, if you need medication, that requires a diagnosis and a treatment plan. And there are times when people do need that. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but if, if it's more about, um, business objectives, career objectives, or even there are some, some personal issues where coaching can be very helpful. You, with, with the issues that you've had, the medical model failed you. And, and even, you know, the diagnosis and treatment plan, they didn't have anything for you with the, the seizures mm-hmm. that you were suffering. And so you would be an excellent candidate for coaching yes. as you were. And, and you are now doing great. So <laughs> learning from the best. <laughs> my ad. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just, I'm really overjoyed that I get to be able to spend this time and to introduce you to people because you really, you were a major part of what helped me to get from where I was to where I am and what I'm doing right now. So I just want to thank you. Um, thank you for your expertise and for your heart to help people. And I want to thank everyone who is watching. We do appreciate, as Dawn has mentioned in her videos, like time and attention are priceless. And so we thank you for joining us.